so I wanted to do a video that doesn't get too deep into numbers or calculations and kind of do like a fun general overview of the classes in Baldur's Gate 3 to help you make that first playthrough decision. You don't always got to get technical to make these decisions. Now do note that I will be doing much more advanced guides in the very near future. And hey, take a look at the recently launched Wolf Apparel store where there's some cool stuff. Everybody's wearing it. Actually, I'm the only one that has any of the shirts and I'm not even wearing it myself. But whatever, take a look. Links in the description. Let's get into the video. I'm going to start off by going over the classes that mix martial prowess with spellcasting. So not full casters, but also not full martial classes. And there's no better way than to start off with the mighty paladin class. But one more quick thing, just note that there will be some visuals to represent what I'm talking about, but I'm not going to go all out as I will be doing full guides in the near future. So you can just listen to this video if you want to. And also note that for some of the scenes, I do pull footage from years ago in early access. So paladins can wield any weapon type with proficiency and also any armor type. There are no limitations. And in a game like BG3, where there will be quite the variety of weapons on launch, this should make the paladin quite fun. Now, paladins are great at taking the roles of being single target damage dealers and, of course, tanks, all while offering some support options for yourself and your party. With charisma being their spellcasting ability, this also makes them fantastic conversationalists, so don't be afraid to let your paladin do the talking. Now, the quintessential paladin ability is, of course, their divine smite, which adds extra radiant damage on top of your weapon's attack. And this gets really, really powerful the more that your paladin develops, putting the paladin in the running for being one of the best single target damage dealers in the game. Paladins also get an extremely powerful, unique to the paladin melee touch heal, but it is limited in use by charges that recharge on a long rest, and this is called Lay on Hands. And I've found that Lay on Hands has turned the tides of many of my battles. Now keep in mind that the paladin is not a full caster, so you will not be getting access to as high of level divine type spells as a class such as the cleric, nor will you be able to cast as many spells in between rests but paladins do make up for that with their martial prowess, and they even get to choose a fighting style specialization. The paladin spells include a mix of buffs, healing, and other support options, as well as a few damage-focused spells, and many of these spells do come from the cleric's spell list. In 5th edition, paladins actually get their powers from the oath that they have sworn, and these oaths are your subclass choice. Your oath choice expands your spell list a little bit, but it also makes certain spells available at all times for you, meaning you don't have to prepare them, which in BG3, a prepared spellcaster has to choose what spells they want readily available, and these spells can only be swapped in and out outside of combat. Your oath choice also gives you these special oath spells, which require oath charges to use them as opposed to using a spell slot. In BG3, you'll be able to choose from three oaths, but you may also find yourself stumbling into a fourth one. Your oath choice is important not only from a combat gameplay perspective, but also an RP perspective, as when you choose an oath, you must uphold it, or you may lose access to your oath's special subclass features. Oath of Devotion Paladins swear an oath to always act with honor and virtue, and they swear to protect the weak. In BG3, if you're a Devotion Paladin and you decide to kill a non-hostile NPC, for example, well, you'll end up breaking your oath and you'll lose access to your oath-specific powers, but there is a way to get them back. When that way presents itself to you, though, you'll also be offered the opportunity to become an Oath Breaker Paladin and go down that subclass route, so you actually have to unlock the Oath Breaker subclass by breaking your oath. The Devotion Paladins are your knights in shining armor, you know, your traditional paladin with sacred weapons, etc. Oathbreaker Paladins are your paladins that really just don't give an F, and they get some really cool darker type necrotic spells, and at later levels they can even animate the dead. Oath of the Ancient Paladins are the paladins that you'd want to play if you want to be a bit druid-like and get some druid nature type spells and really be a force that fights for nature. And then Oath of Vengeance Paladins are your paladins that are hellbent on dealing justice at all costs. And these are paladins that will basically do anything to destroy evil, and this does give them some really powerful damage-focused type spells. So yeah, the paladin is a really cool, powerful class that can fill a few roles, and it also comes with a meaningful RP side to it, which may make this class a bit more engaging than many of the other classes when you're not in combat. I did do an early access guide to the Paladin class a few months ago, so if you want to watch that, I will leave a link below.
Next up is the Ranger class, and Rangers are unrivaled scouts and trackers, honing a deep connection with nature in order to hunt their favored prey. Rangers get proficiency in light and medium armor shields, and they can use all the weapons in the game, just like the Paladin, which opens them up to many different weapon build possibilities. Many Rangers in Baldur's Gate 3 will find their roles as damage dealers and scouts for a party, you know, the strikers of the group. And the cool thing about this class is you can go more towards being like a fighter type ranger that is really just good at traditional type combat, whether that be focusing on ranged weapons or melee weapons or even both. Or you can go down that path of being more roguelike and focusing on stealth and subterfuge. Rangers do get to choose a favored enemy, which will give them some passive benefits and also sometimes an extra spell or even heavy armor proficiency if you choose the Ranger Knight. And they get to choose a type of terrain that they want to excel in. And these choices have a variety of benefits, such as gaining resistance to different element types. All Rangers also get to find familiar spells. You can call in a little familiar at your side, which will have various uses, but do note this is different than the actual beast companion that you can get as a beast master ranger. Now, like the Paladin class, Rangers also get access to spells, many of which come from the Druid spell list here. But Rangers are, of course, more limited in spell level and the amount of spells that they can cast when compared to a full caster like the Druid. One very popular Ranger spell is, of course, Hunter's Mark, which lets you mark a specific target and then you get to deal extra damage to that target when you hit it with one of your weapon attacks. And this is really great because you really only have to cast it once per combat encounter for the most part, and you're almost always getting that extra damage. Other spells include spells such as Cure Wounds, Speak with Animals, Ensnaring Strike, Hell of Thorns, and so on. When you reach level three as a ranger, you do get to choose your subclass of which we have access to three different choices here. The first one is the hunter ranger, and these are rangers that seek out the most dangerous prey, and they get these extra specializations that make them really good in certain combat situations, such as when attacking larger creatures, attacking enemies that are below their hit point maximum, or when they're surrounded by multiple foes. Really good, powerful damage focus subclass. Then of course there is the Beast Master Ranger, and these are your hunters that get an animal companion to fight alongside them. And the choices in early access are bear, boar, spider, raven, and wolf. I think I got all of them, but I'm sure that there will be even more than that on official release. So Beast Master Rangers kind of sacrifice getting the hunters extra combat specializations, but they have a beast at their side to do a variety of different powerful things in the game, such as tank, deal damage, or even utility uses such as scouting ahead. And the Gloomstalker Ranger is the third subclass, and these are your rogue assassin-like rangers that excel when in darker areas. They get bonuses for being the first one to strike in a combat encounter. When they miss, they get opportunities to strike for a second time, etc. A really cool subclass for the ranger that I believe will definitely excel in Baldur's Gate 3. The Rangers are a great class despite their rather underwhelming reputation in 5th edition, and there's just a variety of different ways that you can play this class, from being that more cliche, dexterous archer ranger, to being a frontline knight, or even being an assassin that attacks from the shadows. Alright, now let's transition into the primary spellcaster classes, where spells play the primary role in a class's design, and we might as well start off with the wizard class, the masters of the arcane who combine ancient spells with modern research. Wizards do not start off with any armor proficiency, so most of the time you'll be wearing robes, which does tend to make the wizard class a little bit more on the squishy side, but they make up for it in other ways. And wizards only get weapon proficiency with daggers, darts, quarterstaffs, slings, and light crossbows, but to be honest with you, it doesn't really matter for the majority of builds because you're going to be casting spells as opposed to using weapons. Now, the biggest appeal of the wizard class is their versatility. This class has access to the largest spell list in the game, and as long as you collect scrolls while you're playing and copy them into your spell book, you're going to have a spell for pretty much every situation that the game could throw at you, and that goes for combat and utility situations alike. Wizards can have a ton of spells prepared at one time, and the ones that they don't have repaired, they can just swap them in and out outside of combat. The wizard does get to choose between eight different subclasses, each subclass representing a different school of magic. So if there's certain types of spells that you tend to like in video games, for example, if Fireball is your life, well, Fireball is an evocation spell, so you might consider choosing evocation as your subclass, as you get additional benefits to your evocation spells, such as them no longer being able to hurt your own 
party members when you cast them. Perhaps you love necrotic spells, though, and you want to work with the dead. Well, necromancy may be the subclass for you, as the necromancer wizard gets some additional benefits when relating to necrotic spells, such as more powerful forms of undead summoning. The other six subclasses are Abjuration, Conjuration, Divination, Enchantment, Illusion, and Transmutation. You really can never go wrong with having a wizard in your party, and you'll be thanking them for the variety of utility spells that they have access to, such as Arcane Lock, Fly, and Gaseous Form, and also their crazy powerful spells such as Fireball, Wall of Fire, and Banishment. If you're looking to play a class that gives you a ton of spell choices, look no further. We might as well now talk about the Sorcerer class, which does share many similar spells with the wizard, but this class plays quite differently. So sorcerers are natural spellcasters, drawing on inherent magic from a gift or a bloodline. They also will be wearing robes for the most part, and their list of weapon proficiencies is even smaller than the wizard, as it includes daggers, quarterstaffs, and light crossbows. That's it. But really, who cares? You're going to be slinging spells. So the Sorcerer learns a very limited amount of spells when compared to a class such as the Wizard. When you level up, your choice of spell is quite important with this class. So you're not going to have every spell in the book ready to go at a moment's notice. Instead, Sorcerers excel in their ability to manipulate magic in ways that a Wizard cannot. And this comes in the form of metamagic. So you get to choose certain metamagic options at certain levels. For example, if you choose metamagic twin spell, it makes it so that spells that only target one creature will now target two. In order to use metamagic, though, it does require sorcery points, which are limited in number, but of course they grow the further that you progress in the game. There's even opportunities to turn spell slots into sorcery points and vice versa. So as a sorcerer, you may not have as many spells as a wizard, but if you use twin spell, you can cast a spell such as banishment on two enemies on the battlefield in one turn while the wizard could only do one. There's a variety of powerful metamagic options that you can choose from as you level up, such as one that extends your spell distance, one that turns spells that cost an action into a bonus action, and so on. The sorcerer gets to choose between three different subclasses, and I'll start off with the Draconic Bloodline Sorcerer. Dragon sorcerers have veins that carry draconic magic, and this makes them a bit tankier and also gives them some extra benefits to using and resisting certain types of spells, depending on what choice you make for your dragon ancestry. For example, if you choose your ancestry to be a red dragon, you are then resistant to fire damage, and higher level fire spells will also become more powerful. Wild magic sorcerers are a bit more on the chaotic side of things, as their powers come from the ancient forces of chaos, and, well, whenever you cast a level 1 spell or higher, there's a chance that a random magical effect may trigger, and sometimes this can be really good and powerful, while other times you might be turning yourself or your party members into frogs. I'm not sure if that's actually an option in BG3, but I think you get the point. Wild magic sorcerers get some powerful features that help them land their attacks more easily, but many times these also come at the cost of increasing that chance of random magic popping off. A really fun chaotic subclass to play, and they can be quite powerful. And the final subclass is the storm sorcery subclass, which makes you more powerful with storm type spells such as lightning and thunder spells. And you get some extra features such as, you know, being able to manipulate the wind to help you move around the battlefield without taking opportunity attacks, etc. So if you want the ability to manipulate magic in really cool ways, while at the same time understanding that you probably have to be a bit more focused in your build, the sorcerer is the class for you. Now it's time to talk about the Warlock class, which is a primary spellcaster, but they operate a bit differently than most other spellcasters. The Warlock is bound by a pact to an all-powerful patron, and they basically trade their loyalty for supernatural abilities and unique magic. The Warlock gets proficiency in light armor, so you can suit up a little bit, and they get proficiency in simple weapons, so nothing too crazy. And although most Warlocks will be casting spells on every turn, there is an option to be a bit more melee focused. So Warlocks are similar to the Sorcerer in that they use known spells, meaning you don't have access to the entire Warlock spell list to swap out spells in and out whenever you want in between combat encounters. Instead, you have to choose the spells that you want to add to your arsenal as you level up. This class definitely gets some interesting spells, such as Arms of Hadar, where you shoot necrotic tentacles out of your body. They get Hex, which is similar to Hunter's Mark, and they get access to a few spells that you may find on the wizard spell list. 
The interesting thing about Warlocks, though, is they only have two spell slots until you reach level 11, where you then get three. So generally speaking, Warlocks are not slinging high-powered spells over and over again on every single turn. Instead, they need to be a bit more tactical about when they decide to use a spell. But what they do tend to sling over and over and over again is the cantrip Eldritch Blast, which does not require a spell slot. Eldritch Blast can actually be a really powerful cantrip, and when you hit level 2, you get to choose invocations that can further power up this cantrip to do things such as push enemies back and also deal more damage. Not all builds have to revolve around Eldritch Blast, but the truth is that many of them do. And this can be amazing for some of you, but also a bit underwhelming for others. For the Warlock subclass choices, you're basically choosing your patron. The Fiend subclass are Warlocks in service to the Hells, and because of this, they receive Hellish Blessings, such as the ability to gain hit points back after killing an enemy. Great Old One Warlocks are bound to Eldritch Beings in the Far Realms, and they gain strange powers, such as the ability to frighten enemies when you land a critical strike. And Archfey Warlocks are the final subclass choice, and these are Warlocks in service of a Lord or Lady of the Fey, and they get features such as the ability to vanish into a puff of mist when taking damage, and the ability to charm and frighten multiple enemies at one time. You know, these fey fairy type abilities. Larian Studios did tell us that we will be able to interact with our patrons, so from an RP perspective, your choice of subclass here may be quite important to you. But we're not done with the Warlock quite yet though, as Warlocks also get to choose a Pact Boon at level 3. Pact of the Chain gives your Warlock the service of a Familiar, which can be quite useful. Pact of the Blade, as you can see in the gameplay right here, allows you to summon a Pact Weapon, or bind the one that you're currently using, making it magical. And this weapon will use your Warlock's Charisma modifier instead of Strength or Dexterity like weapons typically do. And this in turn makes it quite possible for some really good melee Warlock builds, where you don't necessarily need to always be relying on Eldritch Blast. Pact of the Tome basically gives you some extra useful cantrips, which are Guidance, Vicious Mockery, and Thorn Whip. The Warlock should be an interesting class, especially with Larian telling us that we can interact with our patron. And also, D&D players, you probably noticed that the Pact of the Blade has been buffed. So even though Hexblade is not a subclass in this game as of right now, Larian's Pact of the Blade homebrew is not something to be overlooked. It's time to get a little nature-y, as we will now discuss the Druid class. The druids channel the elemental forces of nature, and they share a deep kinship with animals. They even get the ability to transform into beasts from all over the realms. Druids get light and medium armor proficiency, shield proficiency, and proficiency with clubs, daggers, darts, javelins, maces, quarterstaffs, scimitars, sickles, slings, and spears. The cool thing about druids is that they can fill so many different roles in a party, but they do definitely excel at support and tank and battlefield control party roles. Druids use prepared spells, so they get access to all of the spells on the druid spell list when they meet the appropriate level requirements. So basically, you can just swap your druid spells in and out outside of combat whenever you want. Most of these spells are, of course, nature-focused, such as Spike Growth, Call Lightning, Thunder Wave, Moonbeam, and they have access to plenty of support spells such as heals and buffs. All druids will get access to their quintessential feature called Wild Shape, which allows them to transform into a beast. In early access, we have access to the cat, badger, wolf, spider, dire raven, deep rafe, polar bear if you play as a moon druid, and we know more shapes are coming to the full game, such as the owl bear shape and the panther. Each form does have its own hit points and strength and dexterity stats, and of course, each form also comes with its own unique abilities, such as the spider being able to shoot a web on the battlefield, and the raven being able to fly long distances and blind enemies, and then you may change into a bear form to taunt foes in your more tanky form. These forms have plenty of uses outside of combat as well. The druid comes with three subclass choices. Moon druids focus in more on that wild shape ability, and they can do it as a bonus action, and they gain access to more beast forms. Land druids focus more on the spellcasting side of being a druid, they get an extra cantrip, they get to replenish spell slots here and there, and they get a few extra spells depending on their choices. And the Spore Druid is the subclass that finds beauty and decay, and they get these cool spore attacks, these necrotic spells, and the ability to animate the dead. 
The Druid is truly a fun and unique class in this game, and it will make for a really interesting Baldur's Gate 3 playthrough, especially when you consider that you'll be able to chat your way through the game with the various animals that you come across, and these animals will have plenty of dialogue and also quests. And we have two more primary spellcaster classes to talk about before we move into the more martial type classes, and let's start here with the Cleric. The Cleric is the class that I have probably brought the most with me on my early access runs as they are such a useful class with so many different possible specializations. So Clerics are representatives of the gods they worship, and they wield potent divine magic for good or for ill. As a cleric, you do get to choose a deity that you want to worship, which will affect some dialogue later on in the game. Clerics get proficiency with light and medium armor, although I should point out that several of the subclass choices expand that to also include heavy armor, and they get proficiency in shields and simple weapons, but some of the cleric subclasses also give martial weapon proficiency. But the base cleric, there's really nothing too crazy here with the weapons. Clerics like the Druid class use prepared spells, so you can swap spells in and out between combat encounters, and when you level up you don't have to worry that much about choosing spells that you want, because you basically always have access to them when you're in between combat encounters. The spells that the Cleric does get access to of course include plenty of support spells, and Clerics can be one of if not the best support class in the game, but they also get plenty of enemy debuff type spells, and even though they don't have as many pure offensive damage spells as say a wizard or a sorcerer, the ones that the Cleric does get access to can be really powerful, such as Guiding Bolt for that single target damage, and also Spirit Guardians for AoE damage, as Guardian Spirits will fly in circles around your Cleric, dishing out damage to anyone who comes close to you. Just like the Wizard and its subclasses, the Cleric has plenty to choose from, and in Baldur's Gate 3 you should expect Knowledge, Life, Light, Nature, Tempest, Trickery, and War as your choices. Your subclass choice will give you some extra proficiencies, such as the War Cleric getting Heavy Armor and Martial Weapon proficiency, making them be much more warrior-like. Your subclass may give you some nice passive buffs, such as the Life Cleric being given the power to heal for more hit points than the other subclasses. It will expand your spell list a bit and give you some spells that will be prepared at all times. You'll never need to swap them in or out, such as the Tempest Cleric getting the Call Lightning spell, and you'll get some special class actions which are called channel divinities and to use these channel divinities it will cost you an action as well as a channel divinity charge very similar to the paladin and their oath charges limited in use but they allow you to use these special abilities that are different from your traditional spells the light cleric for example gets radiance of the dawn which is a very powerful aoe spell that deals radiant damage to enemies in the area so your choice of subclass for the Cleric will come down to really what sounds the coolest to you and what your preferred playstyle is. Life Clerics are a little bit better at healing than the other types of Clerics. Light Clerics are Clerics that get Fireball and they're really good damage dealers. Knowledge Clerics excel a bit more at skills in the game and some more of the utility type things. War Clerics are really good at martial fighting, you know, they're kind of like your warrior clerics. Tempest Clerics get some storm spell benefits, Nature Clerics are of course your druid-like clerics, and Trickery Clerics specialize in trickery and also stealth and those types of activities where you're up to no good. So many great choices for the Cleric, and they're really a handy class to have around. I think of the Cleric class kind of like the Wizard class, it never hurts to have a Cleric in your group regardless of their subclass. And the final full caster class is the Bard class, a class that should not be underestimated. So the Bard knows that music is more than a fancy and that it's a true power. Through study and adventure, Bards have mastered song, speech, and the magic within. The Bard class gets proficiency in light armor, simple weapons, hand crossbows, long swords, rapiers, short swords, and of course musical instruments, which in this game, if you use an instrument, NPCs will start gathering around you and they may even donate, if you're clever, you could use this as a distraction. In terms of spellcasting, bards are kind of like the sorcerer in that they get to learn a certain amount of spells as they level up, but they do not have access to an entire spell list to swap spells in and out like a cleric or a druid does. So your choice of spells as you level up is important here. Bards are presented with some spells from the wizard and cleric spell list, but many of the bard spells focus on support and they do get some great healing spells. There's plenty of illusion spells and also enchantment spells. 
The bard's quintessential feature is its bardic inspiration, which basically allows them to hand out a ton of buffs to friendlies, allowing those friendlies to increase their attack rolls, ability checks, or saving throws when they feel the need to. Handing out bardic inspiration, however, does cost bardic inspiration, of which each bard has a limited amount and they recharge on a long rest. I should also note here that bards are really good at skills in this game, and they are quite literally the jack of all trades, which is actually the name of a feature of theirs, which boosts their proficiency bonus and skills that they are not proficient in. Bards will get to choose between three subclasses, and let's start off with the College of Lore. Lore bards pursue beauty and truth, and they collect knowledge from tomes. This subclass will give you some more skill proficiencies, but also a really cool feature called Cutting Words, which is similar to the Bardic Inspiration that I recently just talked about, except you now will use your Bardic Inspiration to give penalties to enemies to make them miss more often and fail more ability checks. College of Valor Bards wander the land to witness and relate the deeds of the mighty, and they get medium armor proficiency, shield proficiency, and martial weapon proficiency. So if you want to be a bit more martial combat focused and have some variety to your choice of weapons, this is the subclass for you. Valor Bards get a unique use of their Bardic Inspiration, which allows them to give allies the ability to actually boost the damage of their next weapon attack. And Valor Bards also get extra attack at level 6. And the College of Swords Bard is the recently announced subclass, and these are bards that entertain through daring feats of weapon prowess. Swords Bards get medium armor proficiency and proficiency with scimitars, and they get to choose a fighting style to make them deal more damage when wielding a one-handed weapon and no other weapon in your offhand, such as a scimitar, or they can choose to increase the damage of their offhand attack when they're actually dual wielding. Their unique use of the Bardic Inspiration allows them to do a few things, such as deal more damage and increase their armor class, slash multiple enemies, and also push enemies back. There's actually a lot to the Bard class, and they can offer your party some really, really nice support options while also holding their own on the battlefield. Now let's move into the remaining martial classes. So classes that focus mostly on martial combat, but I should note here that each of these classes does offer a subclass that lets them dip into the magical arts a bit. Starting off with the fighter, the masters of the art of combat, who can wield weapons with unmatched skill and wear armor like a second skin. Fighters can serve as damage dealers or tanks, and they get proficiency in all weapons and all armor. All fighters get their own little self-heal, and they get a special fighter-specific feature that's called Action Surge, which gives them one additional action, and this feature recharges on a short or long rest. Fighters, of course, also get extra attack at level 6, so combine that with Action Surge, you can really deal some devastating damage to foes on the battlefield. How you want to play and build your fighter is really up to you, and you can go down more of that strength-based, heavy weapon-wielding route, or you can focus more on being a dexterous fighter and shooting bows or perhaps wielding quicker, lighter weapons, or you can go all in on being as tanky as possible with a shield and a full-on suit of heavy armor. It's really up to you. The fighter does get to choose a fighting style to help them further specialize themselves in whatever type of fighter that they want to be, so if you want to focus on dual wielding weapons, take the two weapon fighting style, or if you want to be a beefier fighter, then defense may be useful for you as you can increase your armor class. Fighter gets to choose between three subclasses, and let's start off with the Battlemaster. Battlemasters are paragons of tactical superiority. And they get these special combat maneuvers, which are powered by your Battlemaster's limited superiority dice. Basically, you choose to add these extra effects to your weapon attacks, which will do things such as make your weapons push an enemy back, knock them prone, disarm an enemy, deal extra damage, etc. And to do these, you must expend some of your limited superiority dice. So you're kind of managing your superiority dice and making sure that you use these special skills, these combat maneuvers, when you feel like it is actually necessary. Champions are the recently announced subclass, and these are your fighters who are true athletes, and they focus themselves on the development of their raw physical power. Champions get to get critical strikes a bit easier than most other classes. They're one of the best subclasses for being really good at strength, dexterity, or constitution checks that you may come across in the game, and they also eventually get to choose an additional fighting style, making them even deadlier. And the last subclass is the Eldritch Knight Fighter, and choose this subclass if you want to dip into magic as a fighter, as you're going to get a few spell slots and also access to a limited list of wizard spells to 
choose from. Now, you won't be casting spells anywhere near the level that a wizard can do. But you will have some nice lower level spell options such as Magic Missile, Chromatic Orb, and Thunder Wave, and fighters are already scary enough when you give them spells it only makes them more intimidating. And speaking of intimidating, let's now talk about the Barbarian class. I had a riot with the Barbarian in Early Access, as Larian did a really great job of giving off that feeling of being a raging Barbarian. So Barbarians embrace the wild that hides inside. Keen instinct, primal physicality, and most of all, unbridled, unquenchable rage. Barbarians can be very, very good damage dealers, very, very good tanks, and I should point out that they have the most base hit points out of all the classes, and they can also be fantastic party scouts as they have a feature that lets them avoid traps a bit better than most others. Barbarians get proficiency in light and medium armor, but they can also go unarmored quite well, and they get proficiency in all weapons and shields. The quintessential barbarian ability is of course its rage, which is limited by rage charges, meaning you can only do so many rages per long rest. When you rage as a barbarian, you deal extra melee weapon damage, and you're resistant to physical damage, and this lasts for up to 10 turns. All barbarians also get reckless attack, which gives them advantage on their next melee attack roll. To take advantage of all the barbarian's features, you should probably be using melee weapons, as rage and reckless attack both require that, so a true ranged build is not as viable with this class. Barbarians, like other martial classes, of course, also get extra attack, and they get increased movement speed. There are three Barbarian subclasses to choose from, and we'll start with the Berserker subclass. Berserker barbs follow a path of untrammeled fury. They get a special feature called Frenzy, which lets them attack or throw a weapon as a bonus action. You know, combine this with a regular attack, an extra attack, and a Barbarian can really devastate a foe in a single turn. Wildheart Barbarians are attuned with nature, and they get to choose a beast that inspires their rage, and this gives them additional benefits and features. In BG3, the choices of your Wildheart Beast are Bear, Eagle, Elk, Tiger, and Wolf. And for example, if you choose the Bear when you rage, you'll get resistance to all damage types in the game except Psychic. If you choose the Eagle, you get to deal damage when you dive down on foes from above. The Tiger gives increased jump distance while you're raging, the Elk gives this charge ability, and the Wolf gives some party support option when the Barbarian is raging. Now, there's more to it than that, but that's the basics of how it works. And the final subclass is the Wild Magic Barbarian, which does allow you to dip into the magical arts, but for the most part, this is uncontrolled. So wild magic barbarians, when they rage, a random magical effect will go off, which will take the form of several different types of spells. But unlike the wild magic sorcerer, there's no negative magical effects that can occur here. It's a really interesting take on the barbarian class and adds a little bit of chaos to your run. And this brings us to the rogue, a class that many are familiar with as Astarion is a rogue. Rogues are stealthy, skilled, and they have uncanny reflexes that allow them to get the upper hand in almost any situation. Rogues can serve as scouts and strikers, and they're really good to have around when certain skill checks present themselves, because rogues get expertise in a few skills which doubles their proficiency bonus. Rogues get light armor proficiency, simple weapon, hand crossbow, longsword, rapier, and short sword proficiency. And take notice that if you want to use a weapon such as the longbow, for example, you may have to look to a race to give you that proficiency, such as an elf. I don't have any rogue footage to show you, and unfortunately, Astarion is not alive in, in, on my current saves right now, so I'm just going to play a little bit of monk footage in the background. The quintessential rogue ability is its melee and ranged sneak attack, which gives the rogue some nice additional damage with their weapon attack. But it can only be used when the rogue has advantage on its attack, which can be achieved several different ways, but hiding in the shadows is a common way for a rogue to do this. Rogues also get the ability to dash and disengage as a bonus action, which is huge for a class like this that oftentimes relies on mobility to survive. There are three subclasses for the rogue, and let's start off with the thief. Thief rogue uses their skills and stealth and larceny to acquire whatever they wish, and with this subclass choice you get resistance to falling damage, you'll eventually get advantage on stealth checks when you move less than half of your movement speed, and you gain an additional bonus action on your turn. And keep in mind that rogues already get to use dash and disengage as a bonus action, so you can really do a lot on your turn. This is a highly mobile class. Arcane Trickster Rogues are similar to Eldritch Knight Fighters that we talked about earlier in that they get to dip into magic 
pulling some of the lower level spells from the wizard's spell list. It's actually a pretty fun subclass, and the spells that you take can get you out of some sticky situations. And the final subclass is the recently announced Assassin Rogue. Assassin Rogues are all about getting the drop on their enemies, and they're more likely to land their hits on enemies that have not taken their turn yet in combat. And they even get an auto crit when they score a hit on a creature that is surprised. Assassin Rogues also get some infiltration expertise, which allows them to create false identities to help them spy, assassinate, and steal. The rogue can be a very powerful class in BG3, especially if you take advantage of the environment and stick close to those shadows. Now I said that the rogue is a highly mobile class, but they're really nothing when compared to the monk. I actually did get to play a little bit of the monk before the recent panel from hell, and let me just say that this class is really fun and engaging. So monks are experts in their ability to magically harness the energy that flows in their bodies, and this energy is called Ki. Monks have learned to turn their key into a striking display of combat prowess, into defense abilities and speed, and even elemental spells. A monk's role in a party is often to be a skirmisher, and they come in with flying fists, they zip around the battlefield, and then they get away unharmed. Monks get no armor proficiency, but that's okay, as they excel at being unarmored. In fact, they get a huge movement speed boost when they are unarmored. And they get simple weapon and short sword proficiency, but keep in mind that monks can also be deadly unarmed as well, as they get to use their dexterity modifier for unarmed strikes and strikes with monk weapons, and they get a little boost to the damage of their unarmed strikes. Monks are of course martial artists, and they are really good at deflecting missiles, in fact they can even shoot missiles back at enemies, and they get to attack several times in one turn right at the beginning of the game at level 1, and that only increases at higher levels. One of the biggest features of the monk is their key, which in BG3 will be represented through key points, which recharge, I think, on a short or long rest. Monks can use their key points to power abilities such as Flurry of Blows, which lets a monk make two unarmed strikes as a bonus action after they take the attack action on their turn. Flurry of Blows was very powerful in the early parts of Act 1 in BG3. Monks can also use key points to do things such as Disengage or Dash as a bonus action. Now there are three subclasses for the monk to choose from, and let's start off with the Open Hand Monk. Open Hand Monks are the ultimate masters of the martial arts, and they get some additional benefits to their Flurry of Blows key attack, such as knocking enemies prone, pushing enemies away, or preventing enemies from taking reactions. Open Hand Monks also get an ability to heal themselves and ward themselves. Shadow Monks are your ninjas, and they get to use their key to cast Darkness, Pass Without a Trace, Dark Vision, or Silence, and they also get the Minor Illusion Cantrip, which can be really good for distracting foes in BG3. The best part of the Shadow Monk, however, is their level 6 ability called Shadow Step, which allows a monk to basically teleport from shadow to shadow, and it's really so cool and so much fun to use in BG3. Shadow Monks can also turn themselves invisible when they're in dim light or darkness. And the last subclass for the monk is the Way of the Four Elements. And these are your airbender-like monks, and they get to use their key to cast a variety of different elemental type spells. It seems like the monk tends to be a less popular class overall in D&D, but if it even slightly interests you right now, I encourage you to give it a go in BG3, because it's a super fun and engaging class where you're always moving around and doing cool things. And that'll be it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. This one took quite a while to put together, so hopefully I could provide some useful information to help you decide what class you may consider playing. Now, don't forget that there will be multi-classing in this game. I'll have some videos on that in the near future. We'll also go much more in-depth into all the classes. I'll catch you on the next one.